Hello, and welcome to Sex Ed, a podcast that carefully explores and shares the history of unorthodox faiths. I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albaney. And before we start discussing today's topic, did you know that most podcasts don't make it past their seventh episode? It's true, and yet here we are now at episode 14. So we just wanted to take a moment to thank all of you, our listeners, for tuning in every other week to hear the two of us talk about peripheral faiths. If this is your first time joining us, we sincerely hope you enjoy the show and will consider subscribing to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And for all the sex ed faithful who've been with us for some time, you can support us as well simply by sharing your favorite episode or episodes of sex ed with a friend or family member today. With all that said, I think it's time we introduce today's topic. On August 12, 1844, a child named Muhammad Ahmad bin Allah was born in the Dongola province of northwestern Sudan. His family lived an incredibly modest life, his father Abdullah struggling to support a wife and five children by working as a carpenter building boats. When Muhammad Ahmad was still quite young, Abdullah moved his whole family to the town of Karari, to the town of Karari on the outskirts of the Sudanese capital of Khartoum, where he lived and worked for only a few years before suddenly passing away. While his brothers decided to follow in their father's footsteps by becoming boat builders, Muhammad Ahmad found himself drawn to the path of his grandfather, Haj Sharif, who had been a revered Muslim holy man. Thus, at around eight years old, Muhammad Ahmad ran away from home to enter a kawa, or Quranic school. Unfortunately for Muhammad Ahmad, his brothers weren't too keen on the idea of losing a pair of hands in their shop, so they tracked him down and tried to steer him in the direction of boat building. Tried to steer him in the direction of boat building. Nevertheless, Muhammad Ahmad ran off to join the Kalwa again, leading his brothers to remove him by force. Finally, the child went on a hunger strike until his brothers relented and at last allowed him to receive a religious education. Little do they know that this was Muhammad Ahmad's first step towards one day declaring himself the Mahdi, the so-called divinely guided one who would oppose the Ottoman and British empires in his quest to establish an Islamic theocratic state in the Sudan. Now, before we go any further, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about what exactly the Mahdi is. Because even though it's a concept that's sure to be familiar to our Muslim listeners, I confess that I never heard the term until I took an undergraduate course on the British Empire, and it was specifically used in relation to Muhammad Ahmad. So, as Patrick said, the word Mahdi approximately translates to divinely guided one. And he's something of a messianic figure in Islam. According to Islamic tradition, there will come a day in the future when the earth is overtaken by sin and corruption, and the Islamic world is ruled by a tyrannical overlord known as the Sufyani. The Mahdi will be guided by Allah to meet the Sufyani and his troops on the battlefield, to end his despotic reign and usher in a period of peace and prosperity before a final battle takes place between Jesus, who is referred to in the Quran as al-Mashai, or the Messiah, and the Dajjal, the Muslim equivalent of the Antichrist. Interestingly, the Mahdi doesn't actually appear anywhere in the Quran. Instead, you have to look in the Hadiths, which are collections of the Prophet Muhammad's proverbs and practices, to learn about him and at times the Hadiths were pretty specific about where the Mahdi will come from and even what he'll look like. Several of the Hadiths, for example, uphold that the Mahdi will be a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad through his daughter Fatima. He'll be named Muhammad and his father will be named Abdullah, just like the Prophet Muhammad's father. He'll also have several distinguishing physical features, including a broad forehead, a hooked nose, and a birthmark between his shoulders. Now, there do exist some distinctions between how different Muslim denominations view the Mahdi. But in the tradition of Shia Islam, the Mahdi is generally considered to be a person who was already born, perhaps in the 8th or 9th century, but he disappeared and one day will return. Sunni Islam, on the other hand, generally asserts that the Mahdi simply has yet to be born. Regardless of the denomination, the idea of the Mahdi has generally been accepted around the Islamic world for centuries, and dozens of men throughout history have claimed to be this messianic figure. What makes Muhammad Ahmad unique is how he incorporated elements of Sufism, or Islamic mysticism, into his movement that began as an insurgency, and eventually achieved the status of statehood. In order to understand the Mahdi's rise, however, we'll first have to provide a brief overview of the social and political landscape of 19th century Sudan, where he came of age. The Sudan, by which we mean the regions south of the Sahara Desert, encompassing the modern nations of North and South Sudan, 
was home to a vast array of diverse peoples, who sadly we won't be able to cover comprehensively in this episode alone. We'll be talking a bit more about individual tribes and ethnic groups later when we discuss who sided with the Mahdi during his revolt, but now we'll concentrate on two major polities present in the region going into the 19th century, the Fung and Darfur Sultanates. The Fung Sultanate was founded in the early 19th century and would become one of the first major Muslim kingdoms in the Sudan. Its ruling family initially adopted Islam for pragmatic reasons. They didn't want the acceptance of any regional animist religions to make them a target of the Ottoman Empire, who had conquered Egypt in 1517 and were quickly bearing down on them. As the years went on, though, the Fung Sultanate began to welcome in more and more holy men from Al-Hijaz, the, the western part of what's now Saudi Arabia, where the holy cities of Mecca and Medina are located. Slowly but surely, the kingdom started constructing mosques and establishing its own Quranic schools, and by the mid-17th century, a majority of the Muslim clerics in the Sultanate were born and educated there. Moreover, the realm sultans began to assert their royal legitimacy in religious terms. They embarked on campaigns to convince their subjects that the Fung Sultanate's governing dynasty directly descended from Umayyad Arabs who had ruled the Second Great Caliphate, or Islamic Empire, following the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Similarly, sovereigns of the Darfur Sultanate claimed that their ancestors, claimed that their ancestors were Abbasids, who had ruled the third great caliphate after the, the Umayyads. According to their sources, after the Ottoman Empire captured Baghdad in the early 15th century, two Abbasid brothers fled, the younger brother, Ahmad, settling in Darfur. The dominant ethnic group at the time were the Fur people, and their leader saw great potential in Ahmad. He made Ahmad his administrator and eventually allowed him to marry his daughter, leading to several generations of Muslim kings who would ensure, the, who would ensure that Islam was their domain's dominant religion. Both the Fung and Darfur Sultanates would face substantial challenges when, in 1820, when Muhammad Ali Pasha, the Khedive of Egypt, expressed interest in invading the Sudan. Now, the title of Khedive approximately translates to Viceroy in English, and in theory, Muhammad Ali was subservient to the Ottoman Empire. In reality, though, that wasn't entirely the case. After Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt between 1798 and 1801, he left a power vacuum in his wake, and a throne that was up for grabs between Ottoman Turks and the Mamelukes, a group who had ruled Egypt centuries earlier. To subdue the Mamelukes, the Ottoman Empire dispatched Albanian troops under Muhammad Ali's command, who performed exceptionally well in battle. But there was just one problem. Once Muhammad Ali purged Egypt of the Mamelukes through a series of brutal massacres, he refused to leave. Instead of turning Egyptian sovereignty over to the Ottoman Empire, he seized power for himself and declared himself Khedif, much to the Ottoman Turks' dismay. Nevertheless, the Ottoman Empire couldn't do much to oppose Muhammad Ali's couldn't do much to oppose Muhammad Ali due to widespread popular support that he'd amassed. Thus, he was allowed to remain in his self-appointed position as Khedif and transform Egypt into an expansionist state, and he had several reasons for wanting to expand into the, into the Sudan. The first was, simply enough, to tie up loose ends. Although Muhammad Ali had quashed the Mamluks' attempt to regain control of Egypt, remnants of their group resettled in the Sudan, and he wanted them eliminated. He also wanted the natural resources that the Sudan offered, particularly gold. Perhaps most of all, though, Muhammad Ali wanted slaves to employ as soldiers in his own military and to give to the Ottoman Empire just to ensure that there were no hard feelings. So, in 1820, his forces began advancing, and one of their first targets was the Fung Sultanate, whose once formidable status had drastically declined. A successful coup a few decades earlier had plunged the Fung Sultanate into a period of civil war and internal unrest, leaving it in no condition to counter the Egyptian army. On June 12, 1821, the last Fung Sultan, Badi VI, surrendered his realm and in return was granted a pension paid out to his family until the time of the Mahdi. Conquering the Darfur Sultan would prove a bit more challenging, but by the 1840s, almost the entire Sudan was consolidated under Egyptian governance. Because the new Egyptian administrators and military officers spoke Turkish, the official language of the Ottoman Empire, 
The Sudanese came to refer to the period between 1820 and 1885 as the Turkiya. The Turkiya was an incredibly divisive period in Sudanese history that met with small-scale opposition for various reasons. First, when Muhammad Ali took over Sudan, he exerted religious dominance by replacing the region's Muslim scholars and magistrates with ones more sympathetic to the conqueror's will. Only individuals who had received a seal of approval from the Ottoman Empire could issue fatwas, or rulings on Islamic law. The Egyptians also suppressed religious orders whom they considered seditious. This included several Sufi brotherhoods like the Samaniya, which is important for reasons we'll soon explain. Additionally, the Egyptian government placed taxes on the Sudanese people, which many considered unfair and onerous. However, perhaps nothing was as controversial to them as the Egyptians' handling of the Sudanese slave trade. Although Muhammad Ali had initially invaded the Sudan for slave soldiers, by the 1860s, Egyptian views on slavery had changed, largely because they were rapidly becoming members of an international community. The new Khedive, uh, Ismail Pasha, also known as Ismail the Magnificent, oversaw the construction of the Egyptian portion of the Suez Canal that connects the Mediterranean and the Red Seas. Consequently, he came into contact with European powers like Great Britain, who had outlawed the slave trade decades earlier. While some of Ismail's predecessors had expressed their own distaste in slavery and even passed laws against it, it was Ismail who actually began to enforce those laws. This angered several Sudanese tribes who relied on slave trading as their sole source of income, augmenting their opposition to an Egyptian government that was still undergoing change. While the Suez Canal allowed for increased trade, Ismail needed to take out huge loans from European banks in order to build it. By the early 1870s, Egypt was in danger of defaulting on its debts, leading Ismail to sell his country's shares in the canal to Great Britain. The British used this as an excuse to install their own agents into the Egyptian government, one of them being Charles Gordon. Now, Gordon is a figure you might remember from our two-parter on the Taiping Rebellion. He'd aided China in their effort to suppress Hong Shi Quan and his Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, earning him the nickname Chinese Gordon. From 1874 to 1876, Gordon served as a governor of Equatoria in the southern Sudan, before being elevated to the position of governor general of the entire Sudan in 1877. He only held that position for a few years, but would return after the outbreak of the Mahdist Revolution. So with all that background information established, now let's now return to the man at the center of our story, Muhammad Ahmad. When we last left him, Muhammad Ahmad had convinced his reluctant brothers to let him attend a Quranic school in his hometown of Karari. He proved to be a diligent student there, and soon moved on to the Kalba in Khartoum before going to the central Sudan to study Islamic law. When he was about 17 years old, he went in search of a man named Muhammad al-Sharif Nur al-Daim, who, pro who was a prominent sheikh or teacher in, in the Samaniya Sufi Brotherhood. In the Sudan, Sufi brotherhoods were highly regarded for the role they had played in introducing Islam to the region. Unlike in other African countries where Islam flooded in in waves, in the Sudan, religion entered in a trickling pace as individual Muslim holy men, many of whom belonged to these Sufi brotherhoods, were integral to that slow and gradual process. Sufi sheikhs, therefore, were greatly respected, and their tombs were even venerated like those of saints, becoming important pilgrimage sites. Muhammad Ahmad begged Muhammad al-Sharif to accept him as a follower, or murid, and having heard about the former's reputation for asceticism, the latter agreed. Thus, Muhammad Ahmad began what Sufism considered a mystical journey through several steps of spiritual attainment in order to become a sheikh himself. Becoming a sheikh was definitely challenging because within the Sufi belief system, sheikhs were considered infallible beings completely free from sin. Muhammad Ahmad trained with Muhammad al-Sharif for seven years, along the way earning praise for his humility by cooking for his mentor and cleaning his house. By the end of his training, Muhammad al-Sharif granted his murid a license to travel and accept his own students. In 1871, the newly minted sheikh decided to reconnect with his brothers, who had relocated to Aba Island in a tributary of the Nile River, south of Khartoum. In that small community, Muhammad Ahmad built his own mosque and his own Quranic school, and he began to amass a fairly sizable following through his preaching. Sometime around 1878, Muhammad al-Sharif received what he considered a very troubling message from his former protege. Muhammad Ahmad revealed that among his followers on Aba Island, he'd begun referring to himself as the prophesied Mahdi, and he wanted his old mentor to join him as his chief advisor. 
Muhammad al-Sharif had visited Aba Island several times over the years, and he was largely impressed with the piety of the community under Muhammad Ahmad's leadership. However, the Sheikh believed that Muhammad Ahmad's revelation was a sign that all his success as a preacher was going to his head. Admittedly, he exhibited some of the signs that the Hadith said would distinguish the Mahdi. His name was Muhammad, and his father's name was Abdullah. His family were also Ashraf, meaning that even before Muhammad Ahmad was born, they claimed to be directly descended from the Prophet Muhammad. Still, he didn't have any of the Mahdi's telltale physical features, like a birthmark between his shoulders, although he did try to claim that a mole he had on his right cheek was close enough. Moreover, the Hadith describes supernatural signs that are supposed to precede the Mahdi's emergence. The sun was supposed to rise in the west. There should have been earthquakes, volcanoes, the dead rising from the graves, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Well, maybe nothing that dramatic, but the absolute surest sign of the Mahdi's impending arrival was the loss of true Islamic knowledge on earth. And Muhammad al-Sharif just didn't think that was occurring. Muhammad Ahmad's revelation, however, wouldn't be the only thing to drive a wedge between the student and teacher. Depending on what sources you consult, the story of the break between Muhammad Ahmad and Muhammad al-Sharif reads very differently. The way the latter saw it, his mentee's ego was simply growing too big for his own good. pro modest sources, conversely, claim that Muhammad al-Sharif was envious of his former student's success to the point where he sent men to Abba Island to assault some of Muhammad Ahmad's devotees. Their conflict finally came to a head at a party Muhammad al-Sharif was holding. We're not exactly sure what kind of party it was. One source we've read said that it was a wedding of Muhammad al-Sharif's daughter, another says it was for his son's circumcision. Whatever the case, there was singing and dancing, and Muhammad Ahmad publicly admonished his former mentor, asserting that, that the festivities violated fundamental tenets of Islamic law. Shortly after this outburst, Muhammad al-Sharif convened a council of Sufi sheikhs that expelled Muhammad Ahmad from the Samaniyah. Muhammad Ahmad turned to Al-Qarashi Ibn al-Zayn, another sheikh in the same Sufi brotherhood for person, who, for personal reasons, didn't like Muhammad al-Sharif. He advocated on Muhammad Ahmad's behalf and managed to win back his Semeniya membership. When Al-Qarashi died in 1880, Muhammad Ahmad took over his branch of the order, all the while proclaiming within the confines of his community on Aba Island that he was indeed the Mahdi. Day by day, Muhammad Ahmad's congregation grew, and around the time of Al-Qarashi's death, a man named Abdullahi ibn Muhammad entered his fold. Abdullahi was a member of the nomadic Bakara ethnic group, and for many years he'd been wandering around the Sudan in search of the Mahdi. In 1873, he contacted a slave trader working for the Egyptian government, basically saying, hey, you're the Mahdi, right? To which he replied with something along the lines of, um, no? So imagine Abdullahi's unbridled excitement when in 1879 he discovered a sheikh on Abba Island who enthusiastically embraced that title. We'll have much more to say about Abdullahi later, but for now just know that his admission as one of Muhammad Ahmad's disciples demonstrates just how diverse an audience that the self-proclaimed Mahdi was reaching. While he preached, Muhammad Ahmad also learned how a wide swath of the Sudanese population shared his personal dissatisfaction with the Turkiya. He furthermore sensed that with the British and Ottoman Turks preoccupied with running the Suez Canal, now would be the best possible time for a full-scale uprising against Egypt. On June 29, 1881, Muhammad Ahmad declared that he was the Mahdi to the general Sudanese public. Now keep in mind that while Egypt had been influenced by its new European counterparts on the world stage, as a part of the Ottoman Empire, it was still a Muslim power, so Muhammad Ahmad's declaration had both spiritual and legal repercussions. Muhammad Rauf Pasha, the governor general of the Sudan, who'd succeeded Chinese Gordon, quickly dispatched a party of representatives to Abba Island, to determine if Muhammad Ahmad understood the potential consequences of what he was claiming. He responded by confirming that he was the Mahdi, and that anyone who didn't believe in him also didn't believe in the Prophet Muhammad or Allah. Furthermore, 
he argued that the scholars and magistrates that the Ottoman Turks had sent to the Sudan followed a degenerate form of Islam, and true Islamic knowledge could only be acquired through him. After taking such a stand, it should come as little surprise that the Egyptian government would respond with a show of force. On August 12, 1881, a steamship carrying two companies of armed troops arrived to Abba Island with orders to arrest the Mahdi, but they decided to wait until nightfall to attack the community by cover of darkness. Um, this, just by coincidence, happened to be the Mahdi's 37th birthday, um, which, by another weird coincidence, on uh, Hong Shi Kwan's 37th birthday was uh, when he proclaimed the heavenly kingdom of great peace. Um, totally meaningless coincidence, but uh, I still think it's worth mentioning. The soldiers quietly surrounded the modest village and opened fire, but little did they know that the inhabitants had expected them and had already evacuated their homes. The only things that the Egyptians managed to hit were each other. In the ensuing chaos, modest forces rushed out of the tall grass armed with swords, spears, and various blunt instruments, and literally beat back the invaders. Altogether, they killed 120 soldiers while losing 12 of their own, claiming a decisive first victory in what would become known as both the Modest War and the Modest Revolution. Happy birthday! So, how did the two imperial powers who theoretically controlled the Sudan respond to this uprising? Interestingly, British Prime Minister William Gladstone initially argued that the Mahdists were perfectly within their right to seek freedom from the oppressive Ottoman Turks, and for the British to fight against them would be morally unjust. Given what would take place in Africa in the coming years, the irony of a British politician attacking another nation for its imperialism is certainly palpable. Meanwhile, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire secretly suspected that the modest revolutionaries were merely pawns of the British, and that unleashing them was all part of some sinister power play. Thus, Egypt's new Khedive was left practically alone to deal with the forces that Muhammad Ahmad al-Mahdi and that's the new surname he adopted, was quickly organizing into an army with a little help from some divine visions. For years, the Mahdi had claimed that the Prophet Muhammad communicated with him directly, and these claims were actually quite compelling because in Islamic tradition, Satan can't disguise himself as Muhammad, so any visions of the Prophet, at the very least, couldn't be the result of some manipulative demon. After the stunning victory on Abba Island, the Mahdi said that the Prophet Muhammad appeared to him and directed him on how to organize what would become a new theocratic Islamic state. I didn't know that about the, um, the visions and the, the what Satan can appear as thing, because that's an uh, interesting parallel to the Salem Witch Trials, which I always yeah, draw because... back to, of, of who Satan can and cannot appear as in these different traditions. I mean, um, that was one of the main reasons that lots of so spectral evidence, who, yeah. like, who were like, okay, spectral evidence, but it might have just been Satan playing some games with you. Yep, and that was, uh, that was their whole justification after they realized that they'd killed a bunch of innocent people um, pretty quickly after the Salem Witch Trials was to, I mean, Cotton Mather came out with a thing of like, well, Satan has powers that we didn't know about before, and he tricked us, uh, was instead of an apology. First, the Mahdi's followers would be named Ansar, or helpers, after the inhabitants of Medina, who'd, supported, who'd historically supported the Prophet Muhammad. At this point, though, it would be helpful to pause and talk a moment about the Ansar. In other words, who were these for people who followed the Mahdi? Essentially, you can divide the Ansar into three major categories. First, there were the Pietists, people who genuinely believed that Muhammad Ahmad was the messianic figure who'd lead them to ultimate peace and prosperity. Second, there was an ethnically diverse group comprised of merchants, traders, mercenaries, boatmen, all the people who consider themselves adversely affected by the regulations against the slave trade. They hoped that the Mahdi would fully restore it. Third, there were the Bakara nomads, who abhorred the Ottoman Turks because of their taxes, and it was this group that made up the majority of the Mahdi's military. So like the Taiping Rebellion, there were those who joined this religious movement out of sincere conviction, and then there were those who simply thought that they'd benefit from a regime change. The Mahdi's vision further detailed how to model his government after 7th century Medina by appointing four commanders with the title of Khalifa, who'd follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad's four successors. However, one of the Mahdi's prospective Khalifas, the leader of a Libyan Sufi Brotherhood, declined his offer leaving him with only three. 
The three Khalifas each controlled a military regiment along with civil authorities to oversee Islamic law. Abdullahi, whom we introduced earlier as one of Muhammad Ahmad's staunchest supporters, was given command of the Black Flag Regiment, the Mahdist's largest military force, comprised primarily of fellow Bukhara. While he followed the examples of several Muslim caliphates, the Mahdi also drew inspiration from familiar Sudanese paradigms in order to secure legitimacy, such as the Sufi Brotherhoods. Muhammad Ahmad wanted, above all, to be treated like a Sufi sheikh, an infallible figure whose decrees in certain circumstances could even override Islamic law. The Mahdi also appropriated the Ansar uniform directly from Sufism. He ordered each of his disciples to wear juba makwara, a robe made from the Demur cotton indigenous to Sudan that was meant to be patched up whenever it was torn instead of thrown away. In addition to conveying one's renunciation of the physical world's frivolities, the the patch robe symbolized a clean break from the Turkaya. The Mahdists wouldn't even wear clothing produced by the Ottoman Turks. The Mahdi wore the same patched robe as his helpers, with the only accessory setting him apart being the silver ring he had in his right hand, because the Prophet Muhammad was said to have worn one. The sense of humility that expressed went a long way in boosting his popularity. Overall, the Mahdi's camps were seen as fairly egalitarian spaces, although it's likely due to practical as much as spiritual concerns. Between 1881 and 1885, the Mahdi was constantly out on campaign, never settling anywhere long enough to establish an ornate capital. There were certainly some elements of pomp carried over from the Funj and Darfur Sultanates, such as special ceremonial instruments, but other than that, there were few religious symbols of, there were few physical symbols of hierarchy. Nevertheless, everyone knew that the Mahdi was their religious leader, since he granted his followers audiences after every noon prayer. During those meetings, uh, Khalifa Abdullahi could frequently be seen sitting at the Mahdi's right hand. As the Mahdist revolution moved into the Kordofan province of the central Sudan, the Mahdi felt adequately positioned to begin passing his own religious laws. In a move that should come as little surprise, considering how Muhammad Ahmad reacted to singing and dancing at a party, the Mahdi issued mandates against what he considered frivolous forms of self-expression that could result in imprisonment, or corporal punishment. Alcohol and tobacco consumption was outlawed, as was gambling and swearing in public. Along with bolstering personal piety, one of the Mahdi's major legislative goals was combating class disparities. While he'd already prescribed a modest uniform for all of his followers to wear, he also made it illegal to hoard wealth. Furthermore, the Mahdi sought to purge all vestiges of the Trachea from his state. If a woman was married to an Ottoman Turk, she was required to divorce him immediately. The Mahdi also closed all four of the Sudan Sunni law schools that he considered tainted by infidels appointed by the Ottoman Empire. Nevertheless, there were some imperial accoutrements that the Mahdi couldn't do without, as he would soon learn. Despite their initial hands-off approach to the uprising, by 1883, the British were becoming increasingly alarmed about the Mahdists. Thus, they dispatched retired Colonel William Hicks to oversee an Egyptian force that Winston Churchill later called the worst army that has ever marched to war. Hicks and the Mahdi eventually clashed at the Battle of the Obayid, where the Mahdists prevailed, but at a heavy cost. Approximately 10,000 Ansar died, including two of the Mahdi's brothers. Up until this point, the Mahdists had been fighting exclusively with swords and spears, rejecting firearms as imperialist weapons. After that battle, though, they started putting the rifles and artillery pieces they captured in previous struggles to work. Here, I can't help but be reminded of the Pan-Indian Confederacy led by Tenzukutawa and Tecumseh. On the one hand, you had Tenzukutawa, who for religious reasons rejected everything Euro-American. On the other hand, you had the more pragmatic Tecumseh, who'd gladly use European weapons if they gave him the edge in battle. And the Mahdi needed to achieve a balance between both of those positions. In desperation, the British played what they considered their ace in the hole by reappointing Chinese Gordon as the Sudan's governor general. He returned to Khartoum in February, on February 14, 1884, where he soon found himself entangled in the web of miscommunication. 
After trying to offer the Mahdi a conciliatory position as Sultan of Kordofan, an offer he outright rejected, Gordon thought the only way to establish British authority in the Sudan was to crush the Mahdist forces. London, however, wanted him to start organizing an evacuation, and when the Khedive gave him two sets of documents, one about restoring a strong government, one about planning an evacuation, he accidentally re released the latter to the public. This led any remaining Sudanese faith in the British and Egyptian governments to waver, leaving Khartoum an enticing target for the Mahdi to begin attacking in March. The siege dragged on for months, and at least eight times the Mahdi wrote to Gordon promising mercy if he just surrendered. Each time Gordon refused, opting to hold out for British reinforcements. When news arrived in January 1885 that a relief force was finally on its way, the Mahdi decided to make a final advance on January 26th, his soldiers broke through the gate and beheaded Gordon in their assault on the city. The steamships carrying reinforcements arrived two days later, but by then it was far too late. Gordon would go on to be remembered as a hero in Great Britain, his sterling reputation best captured in the 1966 film Khartoum, starring Charlton Heston. Meanwhile, the Mahdi waited until the Friday after the siege of Khartoum to enter the city and lead prayer at its mosque. For all intents and purposes, the Turkaya was dissolved and the Mahdiya, or Mahdist state, was formally established. As head of state, the one aspect of the Turkiya that the Mahdi couldn't seem to get rid of was its monetary system. Even, even after the Mahdiya started minting its own coins inscribed with, by the order of the Mahdi, they still used essentially the same gold pounds and silver reals that the Egyptians used. Nevertheless, the Mahdi didn't hesitate to consolidate his power by enacting perhaps his most ironic decree, abolishing all Sufi brotherhoods in the Sudan. Even though the Mahdist state was heavily influenced by Sufism, the Mahdi likely didn't want a rival sheikh arising to question his supremacy. After all, Muhammad Ahmad had already made failure to accept him as the Mahdi a capital offense, essentially putting belief in him on par with Shahada, the first pillar of Islam that requires a declaration of faith in only one god, Allah, and Muhammad as his messenger. There's also evidence that, with the Sudan securely under his control, the Mahdi tried to export his revolution by means of a pan-Islamic alliance. He made contacts with states in West and North Central Africa that were largely unsuccessful, but it's hard to say what the Mahdi's ultimate foreign policy ambitions were, because on June 22, 1885, Muhammad Ahmad al-Mahdi died. After only five months in power, he succumbed to an illness that was most likely exacerbated by how hard he'd been pushing himself to found the modest state in the first place. So that somewhat anticlimactically ends the life of the Mahdi. But not our story. Remember, the Mahdi named three successors, but if we were to think of the three Khalifas in comparison to, say, the Roman triumvirates, Khalifa Abdullahi would definitely be the Caesar of the group. We'll explain why that is in two weeks when we explore Khalifa Abdullahi's reign over the Mahdiya from 1885 to 1898. But before we finish up here, are there any final points we want to discuss about the Mahdist Revolution? There's definitely a lot to discuss of uh, what they do after they've established control, but um, yeah, their, their rise was um, pretty quick and interesting. Um, I think it's interesting that they're a fringe breakaway sect from Sufism, which itself was already somewhat on the fringes, although um, it has a long history of being how uh, Islam spread into places, I mean, like Sudan and like, uh, I know, um, in Bangladesh or Bengal as well, um, these sort of traveling uh, lone Islamic mystics um, have a very interesting history all, all their own, and definitely uh, you could probably do whole episodes just on um, the whole concept of Sufism itself. But this is, yeah, it's an interesting group. Yeah, one of the things that we could also probably do a whole episode on is how women factored into all of this, because as you probably picked up on, the narrative we kind of uh, have been drawing it's a very masculine story, um, and the Mahdi did have like various women who were important to his life and made various laws about women. Um, one of the most amusing 
stories uh, that I read about was basically his first wife, who he married at around the time he moved to Abba Island. She was a distant cousin of his, and she basically hid his books away, hid his religious books away, and basically told him, just get a real job. <laughs> and for that, he divorced her. He, he didn't want anything else to do with her after that. And when he eventually became head of state and he started making certain laws that kind of contradicted elements of Islamic law, uh, one of the things he did was he said, the Mahdi is allowed to have more than four wives. Um, I don't know if he was able to take advantage of that uh, before he died, but that's just one of the things he did. He also... It's a remnant of Hung Shi Kwan again. Yeah. Um, and yeah, these, t I mean, especially coming uh, sort of one right after the other, um, there's a lot of parallels to, to um, the Taiping Rebellion, which... I mean, it makes sense. There's literally... Gordon is in both. <laughs> um, he... So they're fighting the exact same person. But yeah, I always thought it was sort of interesting how, how he's the uh, the British Empire's go-to guy for putting down messianic uh, anti-colonialist uprisings. He, he's got a very specific resume, I guess. Some of the other things that the Mahdi uh, did in terms of women, he, he made a lot of laws which kind of made the early Mahdist state resemble in some ways, say, like, modern Saudi Arabia, women had to wear hijabs, women weren't allowed on major roads uh, or in marketplaces, they were supposed to not really associate with men who weren't their husbands or their family members. Uh, one of the kind of intriguing things he did though, um, before the Mahdi, there was an Islamic tradition that when a woman's husband died in battle, uh, or maybe it's just when Omen's husband died, like she got part of his income, but a lion's share of it went to his brothers. And the Mahdi said that any woman's husband who had died in service of the Mahdi, um, if he was, say, an Ansar, if he was a soldier, she would get all of his money. And with that, we've reached the end of our episode. If you're curious about what sources we consulted in writing it, uh, you can head over to our website, sexed.com, and click on the show notes page. You can keep up to date with you can keep up to date with news about our next episode and every episode in the future by following us on Facebook and Twitter, both at sexed. And finally, if you're listening to Sex Ed on iTunes, we'd really appreciate it if you took a moment to leave us a rating and review. Ratings and reviews help boost podcast visibility and might help us get some new listeners. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is released under a Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at LEADER, the lab for the education and advancement in digital research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed by Sex Ed do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.